<laughs> I know that woman. <laughs> oh my gosh, Tasha, how are you? Good. Good afternoon, everybody. How are you? Thank you for coming along to uh, this presentation. Um, delighted to see so many of our board members here. Um, I'd like to, uh, uh, to mention Raul Rodriguez, uh, Magdalena Caral, Mike Lubrana, uh, Silvia Nunez, uh, Ambassador Wayne, uh, and of course, Rod Kemp, uh, a long-standing uh, member of the, of the board. Um, it's great whenever one of the Mexico Institute teams publishes something new. And in this particular case, we're delighted because, of course, Rod has published many, many, many books in his time. No? I'd like to, uh, to, to show just a couple of them here. There's this one, of course, which is a, a monstrous volume. If ever you do have trouble sleeping, don't read it. Just hit yourself over the head with it, and uh, you will go to sleep. But it, it, is, it is an absolute cracker. This one is the, the Oxford Handbook of Mexican Politics. And there's lots more there, but my absolute personal favorite, and something that you have to read before summer of next year, is this book titled The Successor. Now, Rod published this book not under his usual name of Roderick I. Camp, but Roderick A. Camp, because I think he was trying a different kind of nom de plume. And for those of you who have not read this book, which was published in, when was this published, Rod? 94, I think. 93, there we go. This is a, a terrific thriller about... No, unusual for academics to write novels. This is a thriller about the succession for the Mexican presidency. And the pre-president at that time is trying to decide who he's going to give the dedazo to. And there are three leading contenders, each of which has a dark secret. And it falls to an American academic who does political biographies. <laughs> Sound familiar? To work out what these dark secrets are. The great thing is, is, it's a terrific book. It actually is really, really fun to read. And most people never mention this at Rod's uh, uh, academic presentation, so I thought I'd bring it up. There we go. Um, but we're here today to talk about uh, Mexico, what everyone needs to know. And we're delighted that we're also joined by William Beasley, professor of history from the University of uh, Arizona and editor-in-chief of the Oxford Encyclopedia of Latin American History. Bill, thank you very much for being with us today. Um, we have about an hour and a half um, to uh, to, to listen to the, the presentation um, from Rod of this terrific book. Uh, and then we've also got uh, a video to show. The Mexico Institute was uh, delighted to be able to support the project of uh, filming interviews with uh, Mexican political figures that are tied into this book project. And so we're, we're very happy to be able to show one of those videos here today. Um, and then Bill will, uh, will give us uh, his commentary on the book. And then we'd like to open it up for discussion in typical uh, Wilson Center style. So I'm going to pass the microphone figuratively over to you, Rod, and, uh, and away we go. You don't want to go first? Oh, you can. Go ahead. All right. OK. And I'll, However, well, I try to keep it. my comments as brief as possible because I want to have an opportunity to answer questions. And as Duncan mentioned, we're, Bill and I are very excited about this uh, video project, which the Institute has helped to support. And we're going to show you two excerpts of, of an interview that we did very recently. Well, seven years ago, when my editor at Oxford University Press asked me to join this series, uh, series which is what everyone needs to know, uh, I was completing two other books, one of which was this huge uh, Oxford handbook, and, um, and another monograph, which was the Metamorphosis of Leadership in a Democratic Mexico. Fortunately, as I mentioned in the preface, my wife, Emmy, convinced me to squeeze this into my scholarly agenda. And I have no regrets doing so because for me the structure of this book is unique and it's the primary reason why I decided to take on the project. So imagine if you truly wanted to understand another culture and you would be able to type up a list of approximately a hundred questions of what you consider to be the most interesting and provocative uh, questions you could raise and then have a scholar of that country answer all of your questions. Today, just a few months since President Trump took office, this book, in my opinion, could not be more important given a number of his controversial policy statements on Mexico and Mexican-US relations. 
So the book begins by addressing the most important issues facing Mexico today, looks at security, crime, violence, which Mexicans themselves actually consider to be as important as the leading economic issues, which uh, traditionally are on their uh, personal agenda. A second category of questions, not surprisingly, are also focused on the economic uh, the issues that are related to development in Mexico. And that section deals with policy issues and conditions and focuses on the level of poverty, on the economic relationship between Mexico and the U.S. and on NAFTA as well. Despite the controversial statements uh, um, made by the president or members of his administration, there really has been no public recognition of the central relationship between poverty, economic growth, criminal violence, and the economic health of both countries. So this work tries to provide clear evidence in its answers to numerous questions in these two sections of the concrete relationship between poverty and crime. And as the police chief of Tijuana pointed out to me several years ago, the typical individual they encountered in drug cartels at that point in time <clears throat> usually were male between the ages of 18 and 24 with little formal education and typically unemployed. Mexico, to its credit, has devoted an increasing percentage of its federal budget to social expenditures, and in that category is a notable anti-poverty program. It also includes public education, and it includes health. And those efforts have been going on since Zedillo was president from 1994 to 2000. And in spite of those commendable efforts to address the level of poverty, approximately 45% of Mexicans today measured by income are still living in poverty. And actually the number of Mexicans has increased in contrast to the percentage figures. So we know from many sources that poor subsistence farmers located particularly in rural communities in those states where organized crime is most active will often switch from their traditional Mexican crops to growing poppies or marijuana, which can dramatically increase their income. And our own intelligence agency suggests that approximately 450,000 people are employed directly or indirectly uh, by organized crime. And interestingly, in, in just very recently released statistics, indicate today an equivalent number of individuals are now employed by private security companies throughout Mexico to protect Mexicans from criminal activities. The Trump administration, as you all know, has indicated that it might pursue a policy which I believe is likely illegal of seizing a percentage of remittances sent to families by Mexicans working in the United States. These remittances, which in recent years have amounted to approximately 25 to 26 billion dollars a year, play a critical role in actually reducing the level of poverty, especially among rural uh, Mexicans. The Mexican government has just released data which shows that remittances to relatives from Mexicans working in the U.S. account for 19 and 27 percent of income uh, from urban and rural families, respectively. That's an extraordinary contribution that those remittances are making to the standard of living of those individuals. Any reduction in the complementary funds that come from those remittances will have a serious impact on family incomes in Mexico. Mexico's most successful anti-poverty program, which is now ca called Prospera, is focused on subsidizing through cash transfers uh, uh, funds to families who keep their children in school from the third grade through the 12th grade. Mexico and the U.S. share a highly integrated economic relationship. There exists, I believe, an assumption among many Americans, including officials in the current administration, that somehow this relationship is one way, that is, Mexico is primarily the sole beneficiary of commerce between the two countries. And as I point out in the book, economic benefits to both countries are actually extensive. 
Mexico has played a significant role in the rapid expansion of United States exports in the 1990s and 2000s. In fact, as some of you know, Mexico has alternated between being the second or third most important trade partner of the U.S. in the last decade. As of 2014, the United States exported a total of $240 billion worth of goods to Mexico alone. The most important of those products came from computers and electronics, transportation, petroleum, and the machinery sectors. By contrast, China only purchased $124 billion dollars of U.S. exports during that same year. Exports to Mexico accounted for approximately 1,344,000 jobs in the U.S. California alone, my home state, boasting the eighth largest economy in the world, exported more than 15 percent of its products to Mexico by 2014, exceeding what it trades with Canada, Japan, or China. Also, as of 2014, Mexico's purchases of California exports supported nearly 200,000 jobs in the state. In fact, 17% of all export-supported jobs in California, which account for a fifth of all individuals employed in the state of California, are linked to the state's economic relationship with Mexico. More than half of those export-related positions can be traced to North American <clears throat> free trade agreement, California and Texas, which are the two largest economies in the United States, which are also two of the three largest state or provincial economies in the world, are significantly influenced economically by Mexico. And six states, as of 2014, Arizona at 41 percent, New Mexico at 41 percent, Texas at 36 percent, New Hampshire at 25 percent, South Dakota at 23 percent, and Nebraska at 23 percent, depend heavily on Mexico to purchase their exports. As Senator John McCain noted a couple of weeks ago, the Trump's administration decision to renegotiate rather than withdraw from NAFTA prevented what he described as a horrific economic impact on Arizona. The GDP of the U.S. and Mexican border states accounts for a fourth of the national economy of both countries combined, exceeding the GDP of all countries in the world except for the U.S., Japan, China, and Germany. The U.S. provides the single largest amount of direct foreign investment in Mexico, but what I want to stress to educate Americans about is that Mexican entrepreneurs and venture capitalists invest heavily in our country. By 2013, Mexico had invested $33 billion, the only emerging economy among the top 15 countries with direct foreign investments in our country. In 2015, Pemex, the government oil company, opened its first retail gasoline station in the United States in Houston and plans on opening four more of those in that city. This is a pilot project to test the American market nationally. Also, OXO, another major Mexican firm, has opened two convenience stores in Texas and plans on investing $850 million to open 900 additional stores all over the United States. Finally, Mexico also influences the U.S. economy through tourism in the same way that American tourists play a central role in the Mexican economy. Again, as of 2014, 75 million foreigners visited the United States, generating $221 billion. Canada accounts for the largest number of those visitors each year, followed by Mexico, which provided 17 million of those tourists <coughs> who spent $19 billion. Along the border at the end of the decade, Mexican visitors generated eight to nine billion dollars in sales and supported approximately 150,000 jobs. A completely different way of looking at Mexico and the United States, of course, is the cultural influence that Mexico exerts through music and food and film and language. As you all know, multiple fast food chains specializing in Mexican food are 
typical today. Grocery stores actually stock more items originating from Mexico than any other ethnic cuisine in the world, including some of our favorites as beers, beans, hot sauce, peppers, and tortillas. Corona actually is the best-selling foreign beer in the United States, <clears throat> and many of those foods are so commonplace today that they've really lost their identity as Mexican cuisine. I also found it interesting that the use of Spanish words and Mexican slang is obviously evident in everyday language in the United States. And according to a Pew Center study done three years ago, 38 million individuals in the United States, five years or older, the more majority of them Mexicans, were speaking Spanish at home. Spanish is also the most widely spoken non-English language am among Americans who are not from a Hispanic uh, country. The size of the Spanish-speaking audience in the U.S. has also influenced the growth of co-produced or even sole-produced Mexican films. The musical influence has kept pace with the impact of the cuisine. Just a few years ago in 2010, the New Yorker magazine ran an extensive article about Los Tigres del Norte, which is a musical group from San Jose, California, who represent the Norteño musical style. And they boast a huge following among <coughs> music fans. Selena, who many of you are familiar with, who died uh, two decades ago, has actually sold more than 60 million albums, including songs representing both the mariachi and ranchera genre. And the number of copies of her posthumous best-selling album of all time, Dreaming of You, actually reached five million by 2015. Among young adults in the U.S. between the ages of 18 and 34 who listen to the radio, Mexican regional music now ranks seventh in popularity. Finally, and what's perhaps most unique about this book, and as Duncan indicated, we want to expose you to an example of this, is the integration of digital sources as an inherent component of this text. A year and a half ago, my dear friend Bill Beasley, the editor-in-chief of the Oxford Research Encyclopedia of Latin American History, asked me to contribute to what Oxford University Press itself considers to be its most innovative project in the last two decades, which basically is a digital downloadable encyclopedia with essays in combination with complementary, unique digital sources. So Bill asked me to write two broad essays, the first one on the democratic transition in Mexico from 1988 to 2012, and then he asked me to write another comparable one on the impact of public opinion survey research on the democratic transition in Mexico. We have received support from Oxford University Press, from the Mexico Institute, and a small grant from my own institution. These are professionally filmed interviews of distinguished Mexicans who have contributed significantly to decisive political and social transitions in Mexico. The current interviews include Cuauhtémoc Cárdenas, three-time presidential candidate uh, in 1988, 1994, and 2000. Jaime Sarapuche, the critical contributor to the NAFTA agreement in 1994. Congresswoman Cecilia Soto Gonzalez, who was the first female presidential candidate of the Labor Party in 1994 to win close to a million votes. Miguel Basanas, who was a pioneer public opinion uh, pollster during the critical elections of 1988, 1994, 2000. Felipe Calderon, who you all know, who was very prominent in opposition politics before he became president of Mexico in 2006. And uh, most recently, Sen uh, Senator Ernesto Rufo, the first Mexican political figure in 60 years to win a gubernatorial election in Mexico back in 1989 in Baja, California. We also have had uh, acceptances for future interviews once we get the funding to do so from uh, Sergio Aguayo, 
who's a leading um, civic and human rights leader from that era. Josefina mm -hmm. Vasquez, as mm -hmm. you know, initially as the first female presidential candidate from a major political party in uh, Mexico, and also from Enrique Kraus, a former board member of the uh, Mexico Institute, have all accepted uh, future interviews. And what I find most rewarding about this, as does Bill, is that Oxford University Press has decided, at least for the foreseeable future, to make all of these interviews available to you on the website of Oxford University Press for free downloads. You can download them as often as you want. You can keep them on your computer. You can use them for whatever intellectual or academic activity you might want to. Mexico, Whatever Needs to Know is the first book that incorporates these links in the text where it's appropriate to these individual interviews. Thank you. Gosh, Rod, can you hear me all right? Yes. Okay, good. Gosh, Rod, I think you covered just about everything in your own book, and so this will not be a spoiler session, but I do want to say a few things about Rod's book. Before I do that, however, I did bring some information from the Oxford Research Encyclopedia, and this has the website, so you can connect on there and see all of the interviews that Rod talked about. And we're going to show parts of, we're going to show two parts from the Sarah Puche interview uh, shortly. Now, thank you for the opportunity to visit the Mexican, Mexico Institute. I thank especially Duncan Wood, Andrea Tanco, and the Woodrow Wilson Center for the invitation to be part of this presentation of the second edition of Rod Camp's successful book, Mexico, what everyone, ne what everyone Needs to Know. This is a deceptive title for a deceptive book. Let me repeat that. <laughs> this is a deceptive title for a deceptive book. The title sounds like a primer or a primary school book for someone approaching Mexico and its political evolution for the first time. And indeed it is. As revealed in its structure, there are 12 chapters divided into three sections, major issues facing Mexico today, historical legacies, and Mexico's present and future. Within these 12 chapters, Rod asks and answers approximately 100 questions about Mexico. I say approximately 100 questions because I didn't count them, obviously, and apparently neither did he because he just says in the introduction, I have about 100 questions here and there are answers to most of them. I don't want to spoil that for you, but that's what he says. Let's see what he does. The first of the chapters, Security and Violence, confronts one of the principal problems associated with contemporary Mexico. As he asks, why does Mexico have so much drug violence today? He continues this kind of inquiry to the end of the volume with the in the last chapter, considering the scope of Mexico's future. He offers no predictions, but he does outline the needs for the future within three dimensions. Mexico's challenges, as he said, will be conditioned first by the economy, economic and geographic relations with the United States, and the ability of the Mexican government to, to generate general confidence within the population through effective government, governance, rule of law, transparency, and accountability. Secondly, by the security issue. And third, by maintaining governmental sovereignty of po political institutions at the local level threatened by drug cartels, but also more fundamentally by poverty and the general sense of insecurity. 
Sound familiar? Sounds familiar. Okay, good. For each of these questions, Rod, for each of the questions that Rod poses, he discusses an answer. Many of you will immediately recognize the structure for explanations and teaching. It follows in a not so subtle way the catechism, a question and its answer. And I might ask, what could be more culturally Mexican than this system in the land devoted to the Virgin of Guadalupe? So this, nice going, Rod. <laughs> Thank you, Rod. For example, the first question and title to the first chapter, why does Mexico have so much drug violence today? He responds in his first sentence of the chapter, Mexico's drug problems emanate from the insatiable demand for drugs in the United States. Currently, the United States serves as the largest market for drugs in the world. This is clear. This is absolutely, certainly what the issue is and lets us know that in an unequivocal statement. And he follows it up with a statement about violence drug-related homicides, and says that the leading cause is these murders are perpetuated by drug cartels against each other. The vast majority of victims are employees of the cartels. This is what you can expect to find in Rod's book, a series of questions and unequivocal answers to them. Now, looking at Rod's question and answer system, this catechism-like approach to Mexico's politics and, and history, again, I have to say, it's deceptive. It is deceptive. The structure suggests basic questions and appears to provide facile, logical answers. This is something like the pictures in Ryusa's classic comic books. Cuba para precipiantes, or Marx para precipiantes, or even Nicaragua para precipiantes. I suppose to complete this analogy, I should suggest that Rod's book when it appears in translation, should be called <laughs> Receta Camp to follow Reuses or, or to follow Receta Reus, Cien Propuestas para Salvar Lo Que Queda de Mexico. <laughs> and so this could be a translation. Okay, I'll remember that. <laughs> all right. <laughs> This is all deceptive, as I say, because the superficial appearance actually is much more like an iceberg. The visible peaks that we see in the questions and answers hides its core. Rod Camp brings nearly five decades of investigating, researching, analyzing, and writing about Mexico. This experience informs the book, not just the sophistication of the answers, but in my opinion, the strength of this receta camp is the pertinence of the questions. To appreciate what he has done, make your own list of questions about Mexicans' issues, legacies, and future, and then decide honestly, do they capture the essence of Mexico, Mexican culture as well as Rod has done in this edition? I tried it. Mine did not, although I have to say, I wrote some really good questions, but I didn't have answers. Naturally, we have to ask, what is it about this roughly 50 years of fascination and inquiry about Mexico that informs the author's questions and answers? Above all, Rod has directly or indirectly talked to Mexicans from all walks of life for a half century. He has recorded, pondered, and written about what they have told him. Famously, he provided the first and most sophisticated analysis of Mexican elites in any language. 
His network analyses have brought together the structures of the elite and the political, the military, the church, the economic, and the intellectual circles that he has published in several books. He then brought together his conclusions from these books in, an additional, monogra in additional monographs, especially the composite study entitled Mexico's Mandarins. He has done over 500 interviews. Let me repeat that. He has done over 500 interviews. That's more than 100 a year. That's like one every three days. And included all of the national presidents, beginning with Luis Echeverria through Felipe Calderon. But, and this is a huge but, he has not restricted his interviews and analysis to elites, to the top of the political, economic, military, religious, business, and intellectual pyramids. He's also investigated the opinions, values, and concerns of ordinary Mexicans. This has been made possible by his work with Miguel Bisanas in public opinion polls and value surveys. He's participated in the sampling of this information and placed it in comparative perspective with Latin America, North America, and global surveys on all of these topics. All of these interviews and polling information are written into the questions and answers in this book. As a result, and I essentially believe this, is that this deep background experience leads to a deceptively simple but indispensable set of questions that receives deceptively simple but profound answers. If you read the book carefully, you come away with profound answers. Rod's title is Mexico, What Everyone Needs to Know. And I've suggested in translation it might be called Receta Camp, because this is also deceptive. Both titles suggest that Rod has the answers, a recipe, if you will, that, mark, uh, that, that marks a map to resolve all of Mexico's issues and problems. This is deceptive. Rod's last sentence in the book tells the readers, regardless of which party is victorious in 2018, most of the issues facing Mexico in 2000 will still be at the top of the country's political and economic agenda during that election and throughout the next presidential administration. What his sentence makes clear to the reader is that it is not Camp's recipe or the recommendations of scholars like him or encomia from foreign governments nearby or far away, but it is up to Mexicans and their leaders to determine the answers to the question that everyone needs to know who has an affection for Mexico. Thank you. Thank you. Can we do the video now? We got this ready. Okay. Okay. So this is an interview with Jaime Serra Puche, the creator from the Mexican side of the NAFTA agreement, and we'll, an we'll ask him the question, so I won't tell you the question. Much has been written about NAFTA in Mexico and the United States, but most of those studies published by economists have not really revealed the origins of this idea among Mexican policymakers, rather just attributing it to President Carlos Salinas. Could you please shed some light for us in more detail and why this proposed agreement came about and who in the administration contributed to its evolution? We went through a crisis in 86, 87 that was very complicated. We, we ended up having uh, high inflation rates and so on with uh, De La Madrid. 
So when the new administration came in and I became Minister of Trade, we started analyzing what was our possibility to open up for foreign investment, to open up for trade and so on. Because our relationship with the, with the U.S. was governed by a quota system and something called the generalized system of preferences, which introduced big distortions in Mexico. And the reason why it introduced big distortion is because the, the Americans would give you zero tariff to, for this phone, but if you want to export more, it, up, up to 100 phones. And if you export the 101, the 101, you could lose the, the, the preferential uh, treatment all the way back to zero. So we had firms, Rod, that would close their factories in the month of October because they did not want to go over the top and lose the whole preference, and they didn't want to, to have inventories and to exp pay expensive inventories. So we had a very grotesque situation of something that was supposed to promote exports, which worked at the beginning, but at the end it became sort of a, an, inhibition, an inhibitory effect for exports. So we said, this can't go on. The second thing that was happening is that we wanted to attract more foreign direct investment. And we made a trip to Davos to tell them, you know, that we were a modern country and that we're doing the right policies. Nobody paid any attention. So we had a meeting one evening at Davos, and um, we had already been talking about the possibility of doing something with the trade issues with the US. And we said, well, why don't we try free trade now? And uh, my, the one that was my counterpart, Carla Hills uh, was visiting in, in Davos, and we were, going, we were going to meet the two of us to discuss quotas for textiles from Mexico. So I asked my, my deputy who came with me, Herminio Blanco, to talk to her deputy, a guy called Ron Sorini, who was the guy that, that negotiated textiles, so that they could go to a different room and I could talk to her. So I told her, Carla, we, we want a free trade agreement. She just went like that. She says, but I need to talk to my president. Says, talk to your president. I'm fine, talk to your president. And uh, the rest is history. But uh, well, that's how we decided because the, the regime, the trade regime we were having with the Americans was good at the beginning, very distorting at the end. We had to change it. And it worked well for the, for the two countries and for Canada as well. The Canadian issue is a bit different, but, uh, but it worked well. One of the negative consequences of NAFTA and the mind. Here's the second one. Oh, man. That's special. Central debates in the scholarly world about democratic transitions from authoritarian or semi authoritarian political models to electoral democratic models is the role that global capitalism might play in that process. Arguments have been offered to suggest that NAFTA could potentially play a positive role in the political transition. Opponents of this argument suggest that economic successes, on the contrary, help to maintain such governments. Did you or your colleagues consider this possible relationship between economic change and political change, and do you believe it made a difference in the democratic transition? We have very little authority on that topic, but uh, I think it did make a difference because if you ask me today now, that, now that, by the way, that we're doing a different transition in your country, in the US, you're going from democracy to, <laughs> uh, to sort of a more um, different type of, of leadership, but. Uh, what, what, what NAFTA did, and I, I just gave a talk uh, the day before yesterday in New York about this, is it created a rule of law for many economic activities, which we miss here. So creating that rule of law meant having rules, transparency, compliance, enforcement, and we have been a squeaky clean on, on, on our, with our, all our commitments on the NAFTA. So, my feeling is that that has had an influence in the democ democratic uh, um, tr transition in Mexico, where people realize that you know you have to make commitments, that you have to be transparent, that is healthy and good. In that front, I think it has helped. 
the argument that it, when the economy is better, then the government uh, can have more power and, less, and there is less democ democracy, I don't think that's the case. And I don't think it's the case here. Here, people were extremely hungry about you know, much more democratic issues. So, and you notice it. As soon as things were open, there was a big boom of democratic behavior, if I could call it that way. But I think that the, the thing, I see the solid element that I think NAFTA contributed with in that process was basically the compliance and the rule of law that NAFTA created for a limited series of activities in the country, but it did create an environment of, labor, of, of, of uh, rule of law. By the way, my concern today is that if the Americans decide to, to drop out of NAFTA, we might have problems with rule of law and we might go back to protectionism and to other sort of things, more, more crony type of relationship with the private sector, which I think would be a disaster. We have to make sure that even if that is the scenario, the Americans getting out of NAFTA, which is something you cannot rule out at this moment, uh, actually we have to open more, we have to be more transparent, we have to go out of our way so that we don't lose the credibility with investors, which we badly need. We argue that Mexico has achieved an electoral Thank you. <laughs> so let me just say, it, the interviews are terrific. I mean, we've had Jaime here at the Wilson Center, of course, at the Speaking of the Mexico Institute, and, and these stories are, are now available. I mean, his, his anecdotes, but also his interpretation of history that he lived and he helped to form are now available for, for millions of people as opposed to the, the people who come in here or who watch online. And that's a, that's a terrific legacy of this book. I'd like to kick off our, um, our discussion of this by, um, uh, with two questions. One is for you, Rod, and the other one is for, is for, is for Bill. For you, Rod, I'd like to take up that last uh, line of the book. Um, because I found it intriguing as well, which is that the issues of 2018 are essentially the same issues that were there in 2000. You know, in 18 years, we're still talking about the same issues. And it's a, it's a, it's a question which has come to me this year. As we've been through a crisis in bilateral relations, um, I've been very, very impressed with how the Mexican government has reacted. And it's made me think that when you look at the crises that have afflicted Mexico over the past 40 years or so, in fact, in a time of crisis, Mexico has reacted very well. Mexico did uh, well in the end with the Latin American debt crisis as it pertained to Mexico. It did well with the, uh, the peso crisis. Not always popular solutions, but uh, came out of it relatively quickly. The um, financial crisis here in the United States in 2008, 2009, of course, hit Mexico very hard, but it bounced back quickly because of effective management. Even health crises like the H1N1 crisis in Mexico were handled very well. And yet, chronic problems in Mexico, corruption, poverty, inequality, low growth, etc. Mexico seems spectacularly ill-prepared to deal with those and to make progress. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on why that is. And for Bill, um, you have a perspective um, which is kind of unique because you cover so much of the rest of the continent as well in your work. And I'd like you to, to comment to us on, you know, having seen this project and others like it, and you mentioned the other books about, you know, Cuba for be Beginners, Marxism for Beginners. What is it that makes Mexico unique? It's a question which I'm asked a lot. Why is Mexico different from Argentina? or from Costa Rica, or et cetera. What is it that makes Mexico unique in this study that I think would compel more people to study it? Well, it's a great question, Duncan. I think Speaking the microphone. It, it's, it's obviously very complex, and there are a lot of uh, elements to it. But, and actually, we've, in each of these six interviews that we've done so far, we sort of asked that question as well, because we want to get the the perceptions and interpretations of the six different individuals. And I think there is a certain consensus with, with something that I myself have, have ultimately decided is one of the explanatory uh, reasons for that. And I think it's about, if you, if you look at, let's take something very recent. A lot of you are familiar with the Pact for Mexico, which was this incredible agreement that I wish something to that effect could have been achieved in the United States, where the presidents of the three major parties and the president of Mexico basically signed an agreement 
identifying the major problems that Mexico faced, whether they were economic, social, security related or whatever, and what the basic solutions known at that time would be most likely to serve in resolving those issues. And it was an incredible uh, agreement, about 18 pages long. And in one of our first interviews with Calderon, we actually discovered sort of the origin of that uh, whole development, which was the result of, I think you should know this because it's actually an interesting anecdote which tells you a lot about what was happening. Because of President Fox's attitude towards Calderon, when he became president, and that transition was from the same party, two different presidents, Fox did nothing to help him in a presidential transition, didn't provide any information, didn't, didn't work with Calderon's uh, transition team and so on. So Calderon told his staff before the outcome of the 2012 re election, regardless of who won this election, he wanted every cabinet level agency to produce a, a very short but succinct document about what those policies should be and what solutions did they propose. And you can see this, I just completed a study of the of the uh, Peña Nieto cabinet from 2012 through last year. And if you look very closely at all those appointments, the vast majority of them are from his transition team who were coached by all of their counterparts in Calderon's administration. So I give, truly give Calderon credit for helping to do that. And he's maintained, as you'll note from some of his public statements, a very neutral, nonpartisan posture as a more, I would describe it as a statesman-like posture in his comments about the present administration. And the reason I'm bringing that up is that all of the specialists that I know, whether they were economists or political scientists or what, what their disciplinary background, found those recommendations to be recommendations that most of us would make if we were asked, what would we try to do for Mexico? And so the question is, so if it's good policy, why aren't we getting results? I think the real problem with uh, Mexican governance is the implementation of the policies, not the policies themselves. I'm not saying that every policy is a good policy. But in this most recent administration, those policies were very well conceived and basically were at least a pawn and pre policy, if not upon PRD and pre-policy recommendation. So the, que you know, the question, the more specific question, which might help us all come up with a better answer, is why isn't that these policies can't be implemented successfully? What is wrong with this process? And I think there's something about the, the administrative structure in Mexico where the people at the top or the mid-level people somehow are not communicating with the people at the bottom of the structure. And I sort of had an insight from this, strangely enough, from a, from a student from Mexico who is studying at my uh, college. And he took two courses from me at the same time, which is very unusual. But he took a seminar on Mexican democracy and decided that he wanted to explore the Prospera program in near his hometown, which is Monterey. So over the spring break, he went back to a very poor suburb of Monterey and used a contact with a person where he had done a, a charitable project in that uh, uh, neighborhood. And he interviewed 12, 14, 15 women mothers who all had children in the public educational system meeting those requirements for Prospera. And he got no help from the person in charge of Prospera in that particular community. The person that helped him get the interviews was just a, what I would describe as a civic activist that he had met before. 
And the one thing I thought I knew quite a bit about the program, because as many of you know, it's, it's a program that's been in operation for many years and most widely known as Oportunidades, which used to be its most recent preceding name. And he discovered that one of the complaints of the recipients is that the cash transfer only occurs every two months, not every month. I just uh, always assumed it was a monthly benefit, which would seem logical. And what the women were saying is because it was a two-month period, it was very hard to budget that whatever that cash amount was over such a long period of time, and it would be much more helpful if they would get half as much but twice as <coughs> frequently. This program, as some of you know, has been uh, imitated by the World Bank. I don't know if the World Bank does it in the same way as Mexico, but that program has been in effect for several decades. So there's just a simple example of surely a conscientious local manager of that program would have heard this complaint over and over and over again from the recipients and voiced it up through the bureaucratic system. So whatever is preventing that from happening is that process. The reverse example of that is people at the top who are corrupt. So if you look at, we all know these stories about police corruption and bribes and so on and so forth. And we all should know that police are asking you for a bribe because their patrol sergeant or lieutenant is asking them for some money through that bribe. So they're forced to do this not because they're inherently dishonest. They're forced to do this because somebody up the ladder is forcing them to do it either by threatening to fire them or to give them a horrible assignment or whatever it might be. So you have two ends of this bureaucratic process where there is a serious uh, issue of paying attention to what would be the most effective way of dealing with the problem. One other example that re relates to poverty is, again, I think as some of you know, the Mexican um, Census Agency has come up with a much more sophisticated analysis of who's poor and who isn't by deciding to look at, rather than poverty just from an income perspective, poverty in terms of housing, is your housing adequate versus is your income adequate? Do you have access to education and do you have access to health care versus is it just an income issue? And that, just that decision alone to divide it into three categories gives us a lot more information on which to have a more effective anti-poverty program. So that's sort of my kind of pragmatic take on it at this point. Thank you. Why is Mexico unique? Difficult question. But for today, I have two answers that I hope will provoke some of you to continue the discussion. First, I think since 1917, actually since 1910, but especially since 1917, Mexicans have a burden. The burden is the world's first social revolution and its written expression in the Constitution of 1917. It's right there. That's why the rule of law is such a critical question, because if that Constitution becomes a reality, Mexico will change. We could say the same thing about the U.S., and people have said it at many times that if the U.S. Constitution were completely complied with, this would be a different society. But Mexico has a special burden because of its social revolution. Before the Soviets, before the Cubans, before the Chinese, before anyone else, Mexico had a social revolution and defined what that meant for its people. That's one reason I think Mexico is unique. The second thing I would say today is in the Spanish-speaking world, which involves a good part of the United States, the capital of the Spanish-speaking world 
is Mexico City. If you want to make it in the Spanish-speaking world, you have to go one place. Not Buenos Aires, for sure. Not Santiago. Not Quito. You have to go to Mexico City and make it there. That's where the recording studios are, the movie company studios, the television companies. All of these things are there. We think in the U.S. that there's an Ivy League hand that reaches out across Latin America and snatches up all of the intellectuals. I'm not sure that's true. I think that hand that reaches out across Latin America, in fact, is to UNAM and the Colegio. That's where the foreign students are going in larger numbers and with greater influence, I think, than Cornell Business School or one of the other Ivy League schools. So I think it's those two things that Mexico City is the capital of the Spanish-speaking world. One final example about this, I read recently that both the Chilean and Argentine TV industries are sending individuals to Mexico City to study Spanish. Why? Because they want to be able to dub English language films into a language that people will know. They also think they can undercut the Mexicans on dubbing. <laughs> if, they can, if they can speak Spanish in a Mexican way. Tonight, Tuesday night, one of the networks is premiering a new show. I can't remember the title of it, but it's about a Mexican woman who is planning to carry out revenge against one of the Mexican cartels. Already people are lining up saying it's a fabulous series. <laughs> Thank you, gentlemen. Questions from our public, please, Raul. Or the connections. I'm talking about uh, you know, the, the quality of leadership. Uh, perhaps with the exception of, of James Wilkie back in the 60s who, who recorded a number of fascinating interviews. But I believe that these tapes will, will be made public. He was telling me just recently, and uh, shortly. And, and it would be great to compare that with what you've done over the over recent decades. Um, and, and he interviewed Gomez Morin and, and, and Chris Crepe Barrola and Portes Hill and some others. How do you assess, based on what you've done, and perhaps adding what, what James did uh, back then, how do you assess the evolution of leadership and how you link it with the difficulties that we still have in Mexico in terms of implementation, as you called it? Oh, boy. <laughs> that is really a difficult question, I'll say. Um, I think that uh, having looked at it over time and, and just to put this in context because Raul's question is very interesting. Uh, when I started interviewing people, most of the people that I interviewed were individuals beginning with the Miguel Aleman administration. So I was interviewing people that grew up in the first decade of the 20th century. Many of them were teenagers during the revolution. Some people that I interviewed actually were children participants in the revolution and that had a tremendous impact on them. So there are a number of sort of evolutionary points where you could see significant changes, one that's much more well-known but sort of isn't looked at collectively, which had two components to it. One was all of the civilian figures that became prominent starting in the late 1930s under Cardenas, but more notably under Abel Camacho and especially Miguel Aleman was this conflict between civilian leadership versus military leadership. So going back to Bill's point about the revolution, you can't underestimate the impact of the revolution not only on the culture and uh, 
on values that determine some of the legislation that came out of the 20s and 30s, but also on individual leadership. And that impacted that in two really broad ways. One was the need to get military personnel, and particularly self-made military personnel who weren't well-educated, out of those influential decision-making positions and replace them with civilians. So you had this numerous examples of very pro late, later prominent Mexicans who were in their 20s becoming presidents of notable universities, for example, because the revolutionary governor of X state recognized that he didn't have much knowledge and he wanted somebody who was well-educated to be doing an educational job. But the second element is the degree to which Mexicans were all touched by violence. So this determines, I, I actually would argue that it affected the next two, maybe even three generations, that no matter what, Mexico was never going to use violent means of changing political power the way that this occurs between 1910 and especially 1920 with several s smaller revolts in 23, 27, and 29. And even imagine, if you think of Miguel Aleman, who I think was undervalued by political scientists in terms of the impact that he had, his own father, who was a leader of the 29 movement, was killed, as you know, and the impact of that on him and on his generation was critical. The, sec the second element that was particularly significant, I think, on Mexican leadership was the importance of the National University and the National Preparatory School. If you go back all the way to the 1880s, and uh, I don't know, I guess they had them on three by five cards at the archive at the National University, and I was trying to find how much overlap there was among prominent intellectuals, prominent entrepreneurs, and Mexicans going all the way back, even though I wasn't focusing on the 1880s. It was like a who's who mm -hmm. of Mexico in every one of those decades. It was just astonishing. And Aleman really becomes the defining generation which is advancing the importance of a university credential, everybody having a college degree. And of course, as you know, the pre preeminent degree was in law, at the law school. But the National Preparatory School was equally significant. And I remember people, I would be interviewing them. Antonio Armendariz, who was Assistant Secretary of the Treasury under Ruiz Cortines, was a member of Aleman's generation. I said, well, you know, how well did you know all these people? And I actually, in the early days, I didn't interview people. I wrote to them from the United States and got their addresses and telephone books at the Hispanic Foundation at the Library of Congress. And I probably got a 20 to 30 percent response rate. Those days, people actually put their address in a phone book. And they would list all these people that they went to school with. But when I interviewed Armand Doris, and I interviewed him multiple times, he said, OK, OK, Roderick, let's see. And then he started in alphabetical order, and he just went da -da 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 -da, all the last names. And it was like a who's who of politicians in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. The reason I'm emphasizing that is because there was a smaller number of institutions, and they were all being educated. There was much more of an overlap among leadership groups, particularly between entrepreneurial leaders and political leaders. Mm -hmm. Then once you have the growth of private universities, that helps to separate those. That has certain positive benefits, but it also created less, of, less cohesiveness in terms of the values. And then when I explored the evolution of priests into bishops and archbishops and even a few cardinals, I discovered that at the regional level, at the local level, very often, particularly in the 20s and 30s when the educational institutions were weak after the revolution, a lot of these politicians went to seminary school. 
they became really good friends with future priests. So just take the state of Mexico, where this recent election took place. The, one of the leading figures in the state of Mexico, the governor of the state of Mexico, went to school with a person who also was in seminary school, who later became the bishop of Toluca. So there was, a, again, a lot of personal contact between different groups. By the time you get to the 80s and 90s, that is gone. And that sort of universality, and you see it in different ways. I remember that during the really critical economic years where inflation was 40, 50, 60% under De La Madrid's administration in the 1980s, and I was doing this work on capitalists and entrepreneurial leaders. And all of the older people from very prominent families, I was saying, I see that a lot of young entrepreneurs are abandoning Mexico, going to the United States because of they couldn't cope with that, that such dramatic change in the economic condition. And they said, oh, you know, we've been through this all before <laughs> back in the 20s. And they weren't they weren't, had no notion of leaving Mexico whatsoever. They would just weather those really difficult, and they were really difficult times, and come back. So even there was a generational divide, even in the sense of your sort of, I call it economic patriotism, you were gonna stay and help your country get through this, whereas the younger generation was leaving as fast as they could to go somewhere else where they might be more successful. So I think that that is, you know, one of the dramatic elements that goes all the way back and really links to what Bill said about how a single event which touches so many people, and there was a very famous um, survey study, a small study done in the maybe late 80s, where the person asked all, he was actually working on labor unions and he was interviewing all of these different people and he said, asked a question that basically said, were you or your family personally touched by someone who either fought in the revolution or was killed in the revolution or wounded in the revolution? And it was astonishing, even as late as the 60s and 70s, that it was just about every person in Mexico was connected in one way or another to that event. Thank you. Um, Patricia, you had your hand up before, and then the, yeah, yeah. thank you. Thank you. Um, Rod, congratulations on your, on your book. Um, I wanna tap on your, one of your um, main areas of expertise, which is the Mexican military. And in this case, you have a chapter on, on security. Um, the Trump administration has posed a serious, a serious uh, challenges to U.S.-Mexico relations, uh, in particular in regards to uh, NAFTA, immigration, and border security. So I would like to, to get your opinion about um, What's, what's gonna happen to this current state of excellent uh, US-Mexico military to military relations? Can we expect that this would continue under Trump and the future president, whoever it is in Mexico? Because the Mexican government has had uh, in various uh, moments already stated that um, he's gonna put uh, the government is going to put security on the agenda of uh, the, the renegotiation of NAFTA. So what do you think? Thank you. Oh, it's, a, it's an excellent question. As you, and I think it's really important what you said that I think a lot of people think because of all of the discussion in the media about the sort of upsetting commentaries uh, from the American side that have particularly upset the Mexican side, particularly the population in general, not just decision makers in the government, that as I think most insiders know, the relationship has been very positive actually, and has always functioned very well. 
And what's notable is you're implying the relationship between the two defense departments and the personnel has never been better than it is right now, astonishingly. <laughs> so I'm hopeful, probably like you, that that is not going to be adversely affected. And I think unless it has some direct significant impact on the mission that the military is asked to play in Mexico by the civilian leadership, I don't think it will have an adverse impact. But if it, it increases the intensity of performing some of these missions, which the military has been willing to do, but isn't always publicly honest about saying they really don't want to do it, that that could produce a situation where you might have more resistance, even within the military, to carry out those activities. That's why I make such an effort to link poverty to all of these other issues. And one of the people that I knew best was the uh, General Vega, who was Fox's Secretary of Defense, who actually, this is one of these cases where I didn't, I actually interviewed him many years ago when he was director of the of the National uh, Defense College, and then when he became defense minister, naturally I was really kind of excited to be able to maybe have the opportunity to talk to him again. Instead of my asking him for an interview, he asked me to come down with no explanation. As I was telling Bill about this, so when a defense secretary in Mexico asks you to come, you don't say why, you just go. and. Uh, I don't know, I still to this day, I don't know exactly why, but he wanted to talk to me. So of course I had an opportunity to ask him questions. And I said, and it was just the beginning of the impact of China on the relation, the economic relationship between the US and China and the US and Mexico and having an adverse effect to some extent on Mexican trade and um, investments in Mexico. And I said, well, what is the most important national security issue? He didn't hesitate, he said poverty. That's the most important national security issue. I was personally so excited to hear, you know, the general commander in chief of the military saying that poverty. And it's important to remember that he, he actually wrote the manual which the War College uses in Mexico at that time and before uh, for their course on national security. So he obviously emphasized that in his own writings. But I thought it was very perceptive. He wasn't going to talk about violence. He wasn't going to talk about crime. He was going to talk about poverty. Microphone is coming to you right now. Oh, thank, thank you. you. This question is for Bill. It's a historical question. I would posit in your um, analysis of why Mexico is different from the rest of Latin America, and I've done a little bit of research on this, is that Mexico, unlike most of the, of, um, the Western Hemisphere, had relatively little immigration to, let's say, 1940. It was much more Mexican than any of the other countries were themselves. And so I think that's what, one of the reasons that Mexico is different from the rest of the Western Hemisphere. And I'd like to hear what you have to say about it. I'm not going to disagree with you, Tasha. <laughs> <laughs> I won't risk that. Nice but, try. <laughs> but certainly... That's part of what makes Mexico different, is the different immigration that did take place. Lebanese, for example. The Lebanese have played a major role in Mexico. That would be one thing. The different indigenous heritage that Mexico has and is still part of Mexico's population with Aztec, Maya, and 63 other uh, indigenous groups also was important. The region of origin in Spain of 
those Spaniards who came to Mexico, Extremadura especially, uh, influenced the language and influenced the kind of culture that took place. And then uh, how Vasconcelos and others, after 1910, attempted to blend this all together, to make this all come together. So absolutely, you're correct on the difference of uh, the absence of Italians or Spaniards or Germans to the same extent as Argentina, Chile, Brazil, the absence of Japanese in the same numbers as in Brazil, the absence of Chinese as there is in Peru. So immigration has had a huge role in shaping um, Mexico's different culture. I would just add a really great example of your question, Tasha, is uh, which I discovered in some detail when I was interviewing a Catholic priests and bishops in Mexico that there were approximately, at that time, 10,000 uh, priests in Mexico. And during all those years, say from 1930 to the time I was doing the interviews in the mid-1990s, they had only allowed 40 priests who were non-Mexican to be functioning in that country, which explains the significant difference in uh, revolutionary theology principles that were so widespread in other countries like Brazil and, and so on, and not commonplace at all in Mexico. And that was a purposeful exclusion. They didn't want Spanish priests, they didn't want Europeans, and they didn't want American priests coming to Mexico and kept it about as pure as you could keep it to a Mexican population of professionals. Yeah, I have time for a... Uh, sorry, Bill, you Oh, I was just going to say one thing that we should also take into account is there is something about Mexican music that once it gets in your mind, you can't get it out, and it's <laughs> all over. If you look in the telephone book in Bogota, there are 20 pages of mariachi bands. Colombians love Mexican music. Chileans love Mexican music. It's all over the place, and it, this is really why I, want, why I wanted to tell you this. I just found out that in <laughs> Easter Island Society, Easter Island Society, <laughs> there are groups that sang Mexican corridos to a Polynesian beat. <laughs> this is something that makes Mexico unique. Yeah. <laughs> I'm picturing giant stone heads with mariachis <laughs> on, but uh, it'd be kind of awesome, wouldn't it? Yes, please, oh question over God. here. Do we have the microphone? Please. Oh, you yeah. I'm very much looking forward to your book. Uh, the first time I'd gone to Mexico was to drive down from the Midwest to go to a law semester course in Cuernavaca, and I fell in love with the country, drove back and forth many times. Uh, from a specifically business side, I have a question for you. It's very interesting to me what you're saying about philosophy or standards that are present as opposed to implementation. And we work a lot in the business community. We run into one very, very specific issue. In trying to get credit reports, and I know this is really down in the weeds, in trying to get credit reports specifically out of the federal district, we may have a month to two month delay. So people wanting to do business with Mexicans, they don't want to fly b blind. And so what do you think is going on there other than government bureaucracy sucks? <laughs> and secondly, what might be done to say to somebody, because we've talked to representatives of the Mexican government and we just can't even get a foot in the door. What do you think's going on and what do you think might be done? I appreciate it, thank you. Well, I don't have an explanation for what could be done, but I, I think I can tell you why this is uh, difficult, you'd think, at this day and age, it would not any longer be difficult. But you have to understand from a recent historical perspective, and I'll give you an example of this, but 
basically business relationships involved personal trust. So like was a handshake system. Uh, you didn't provide a credit report or any kind of financial information. I mean, that was so commonplace that in the late 1990s, I was asked to testify in federal court in San Francisco of a handshake agreement with a major Mexican corporation and a representative of some company in the United States. And I wrote back to this law firm and I said, well, you know, I would be happy to do this, but, and what they wanted me to testify is that that really was the norm in Mexico, and it was, which you find in so many societies and cultures where institutional or institutionalization is weak or not consistent or not well established so that everybody is following the same rules. And that's why I think this issue of the rule of law, which Jaime mentions in the interview, is such a critical issue. And you have two presidents in particular who stress that for better or for worse. The first one was Zadio, who invited me to come down and meet him before he became president, but after he was elected. And that's all he talked about with me. And I tell people this one aspect of it that nobody believes me. But he actually was talking to me about, well, maybe Mexico should consider a parliamentary system. I was just flabbergasted. I mean, I wish I had that on tape, but I don't. And the point is that that wasn't, that was never emphasized. And I think that's why Jaime Sarapuche could make a really strong case about the thing he's so scared about more than just the economic arrangements that it would affect is it's the one area where apparently, and I've not only heard him say this, but other people say that the enforcement of those agreements is for people like you or people from other countries that if they're working through that venue, they can they can rely on that. But you can be the most influential person in Mexico, and a, a member of our board told us this story once in Mexico who had contact with presidents and had been a cabinet member and was doing some consulting for a business it, from the United States that wanted to do business in Mexico, and it was one of these situations where people were trying to force them to pay a bribe in order to get the real estate to build the company. I'm sure you've run into this. I mean, he went to the president of Mexico. If the president of Mexico can't deal with a problem that's that straightforward, you know who, who the people are, it's not hidden like it might be an organized crime, then you have a serious problem in terms of the whole legal system and the lack of trust that ordinary Mexicans have in the legal system. And that persists in spite of the fact there's been some really interesting changes in the legal process as far as criminal law is concerned, but not so much in commercial, other commercial areas. Um, if you're interested, I, I know a guy. Um, <laughs> no, seriously, it's actually a Canadian who lives in Mexico who actually does full background checks, and part of that is the is the credit rating for people. So if you like, speak to me afterwards. I'll I'll, I'll give you his uh, his contact. Um, I always like saying I know a guy. It's a good thing to say, you know. And just just to to back up your point, Rod, when I, when I was hired at the ITAM back in October of 1995. I said to the head of the department, I said, so should we sign a contract? And I said, this is Mexico, we don't do contracts. And I said, what do you mean? Like, there's there's going to be some kind of contract between me and the university. He says, no, it, it'll, it'll work differently than that. And I was like, okay. And when I showed up, he said to me, actually, I haven't actually cleared this with my boss yet. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, there's, there, there's a moral tale there for everybody. Um, let me please uh, let's say thank you to both Bill and to Rod for your, for your excellent uh, conversation discussion here today. Um, I missed the opportunity because they came in a little bit after I made the answer, but I uh, want to recognize Diana Negroponte, Lena Ornelas, and Larry Harrington for being here from our board. Thank you very much uh, for coming along. 
Um, we're about to kick off a, a Mexico week, or we're kicking off a Mexico week here at the Wilson Center. Tonight is our, uh, is our, is our board dinner. We're all going to get together. And then, of course, tomorrow we have our board meeting, and then we have a book launch uh, tomorrow afternoon for Luis Rubio's uh, latest uh, volume called The World of Opportunities. Um, it turns out that on Wednesday morning we'll have um, uh, Mexico City's head of government, Miguel Mancera, um, uh, coming to, to, uh, to, to speak with a, with a group of people. Um, I have to give testimony on the Hill uh, immediately after that, and then I fly off to Mexico for the first of our public health meetings in Mexico, which is a new uh, branch of work. So it's going to be a busy week for us, but we're incredibly grateful um, to you, Rod, and to you, Bill, for, for taking the time to come up and for, for choosing to work with us. It was a, a real honor to be able to be part of this project. Um, and, uh, you know, we appreciate all of your, uh, your, your hard work for us. And let me just make this last final announcement, which is that uh, in addition to being a, uh, a cherished board member, Rod has agreed to come on as a global fellow here at the, uh, at the Mexico Institute. And so we'll be a, a non-resident fellow um, who will be uh, writing more frequently for us. So thank you very much. Congratulations, Rod. Terrific book. you like that? I loved it. <laughs> what are you doing Hi, good to see you. Good to see you. Oh, yeah. Terrific. Are you good. living in Mexico? Uh, well, yeah.